the, the title of this panel is Regulatory Trends Charting the Path Forward for FinTech. Um, and Alex, I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself and also your panel. So why don't you take it from here? It's been great today to hear uh, from so many wonderful speakers about all the exciting projects they're working on in the financial innovation space. Uh, and I want to thank you, Howard, uh, and the rest of the Dune Insights team and Nick for bringing everyone together today to talk about all these exciting topics. You know, when I started, uh, when I started my career in financial services, one of the things that most uh, excited me about the industry, frankly, was the interplay between regulation and innovation. Given that we operate in such a highly regulated space, every new company and idea exists in the backdrop of this regulation uh, and something we've talked a lot about today. And, and every one of these companies must figure out their path to achieving product market fit and doing so in a compliant way. And this is no small feat, uh, given the alphabet soup of federal agencies and the many state legal requirements that various financial services companies have to comply with. So, um, you know, given at the speed at which the industry is changing today uh, and the regulatory environment at the same time, it certainly feels to me like this challenge has been you know, never more true than it is today. And that's why I'm so fortunate today to be joined by this excellent panel uh, to discuss the changes taking place in the financial services regulatory environment and how that is and will impact those of us in the community that are entrepreneurs, investors, and innovators. So with, that, with those introductory comments, I just wanna take a moment to, uh, to do quick introductions of the panelists um, to save time and then I'll jump into questions. Um, and we're happy to take questions from the audience as well. So feel free to add any of your, your questions here to the chat and we'll get through as many of those as we can at the end. First up on my introduction list is Amy Friend, longtime friend and senior advisor at FS Vector, strategic advisory firm, which offers a broad range of services to innovative financial institutions and FinTech companies. Amy is also a board, on the board of directors at Vero Bank and the chair of the board at FinReg Lab, a nonprofit innovation center that tests new technologies uh, and data to inform public policy. From 2013 to 2017, Amy was senior deputy comptroller and chief counsel at the office of the comptroller of the currency, where she was on the agency's executive committee. And prior to that, Amy was a managing director at Promontory Financial Group, as well as a host of other uh, amazing accomplishments. Uh, next is Andrea Mitchell, uh, my partner at Mitchell Sandler. I should have said uh, that I'm a partner at Mitchell Sandler. Um, and Andrea is the, the founder and managing partner at Mitchell Sandler. She's a nationally recognized advisor uh, to banks, financial services companies, third-party service providers on a whole host of enforcement and regulatory matters. She represents clients on, among other, other areas, fair lending, fair servicing, and responsible banking issues, as well as providing her expertise uh, on the corporate governance side uh, for, for bank boards. Uh, up next is Eric. Uh, Eric Sibbett is a partner at O'Melveny & Myers in San Francisco. And he counsels clients on a wide range of capital markets, securities laws, and corporate governance matters, and has deep experience specifically in the, mat in the topics we're going to talk about today in the crypto, blockchain, and DeFi space, among others. And last but not least, and we're still waiting for Troy here, so hopefully he'll be joining momentarily. Uh, Troy Paredes is the founder of Paredes Strategies, LLC. From 2008 to 2013, Troy was an SEC commissioner and he now advises on financial regulatory compliance, risk management, corporate governance and regulatory strategy issues. He was prior to that a professor of law at the Washington University in St. Louis and has served as, as a lecturer and scholar at a variety of other uh, law schools as well. So I'm sure I've missed a lot of important accomplishments, but let's just jump right in to, uh, to, to make the best use of our time together. I'm going to start um, with, with you, Amy. You know, two, two trends really seem to be playing out simultaneously right now, at least. You know, one is that the pandemic has greatly accelerated the adoption of technology, including fintech. And at the same time, you know, fintech has matured as a sector 
This has also highlighted the importance of the connectivity between the financial technology innovators and the banks themselves. So where, where, you know, where are the banking regulators today, in your opinion, on encouraging and regulating technology? What's that relationship like? And what do you think are some of the key issues that we should be keeping our eyes on? Thanks, Alex um, and Howard and Nick. Thanks for inviting me to this panel. I'm excited to join my fellow panelists and moderator to talk about this issue. And you're right that the pandemic has absolutely speeded up the pace of adoption of financial technology. And we see, you know, many, many more individuals that have gotten their services online in terms of banking and, and everything else. Um, and I would say that in the US, the regulators have been a little bit slow um, in innovation. Uh, in 2015, I, under um, then Comptroller Curry, I had led this initiative at the OCC to understand innovation and encourage responsible innovation in the federal banking system. Um, we established the first Office of Innovation at a Prudential Regulator. Now all the banking agencies have an Office of Innovation along with the CFPB. Um, so the OCC, out of that initiative came the Special Purpose National Bank Charter which was a special charter for fintechs um, that could meet the rigorous standards of becoming a bank. And the OCC was promptly sued. Um, and so they're still in litigation right now in front of the Second Circuit. Uh, the FDIC has their Office of Innovation. Uh, they also have worked on a tech sprint looking at um, call reports and how to streamline uh, and, and digitize call reports and, and the filings. And they provided deposit insurance for two ILCs in the last year. And they have been criticized for doing that. Uh, the Fed has indicated an interest in faster payments, which is underway. And they're looking at central bank digital currencies. But I would say that's sort of a slow go as well, particularly when you look at what China has recently announced, which is a, a digit, central bank digital currency for their country. Um, so the market is moving forward. It is not stopping. It's not waiting for the regulators. But you know, as I said, as the agencies have moved forward, they have met with resistance. Um, as I, uh, the states have sued the OCC on the special purpose charter, the ILCs um, have been criticized, the FDIC has been criticized by competitors of ILCs, which would be the banks, largely big banks, small banks. Um, and Congress has threatened to overturn a recent rule that was put into place at the OCC by Acting Controller Brooks which established who the true lender is in a relationship between a bank and a FinTech. Uh, and the criticism has been that that will enable FinTechs to take on the attributes of a bank and override state consumer protections. Uh, and the consumer groups are largely focused on usury ceilings. So, um, so I, I think the criticisms have come from we don't like the models, what, what groups might call rent a charter. Uh, we don't like the regulatory arbitrage that uh, a company might seek some type of regulation in order to avoid another. We don't like the unlevel playing field because an ILC or a special purpose bank is not subject to Fed supervision and activities restrictions. And so as um, agencies have made their way forward in slow, sort of slowly, other than what Brian Brooks did, which was, I would say, a fit of activity in the crypto space. Um, they have met with some resistance, but I think regulators can do more. Um, I think that when we have a system that has been, has left so many out, you know, the established system has not been fair for everyone. And that same system has been under a lot of criticism. But then if the innovations are also criticized, I think I've got to sort of say, where are we? Where do we go? And the only way forward, I think, 
is for the regulators to really understand the technology. I think they have a unique convening power because everybody will come when they say they're interested. I think they can get diverse views around the table. I think they need to work closely with industry to understand what's going on and encourage innovation for good. But they can't turn the other way. They can't turn back the clock. Um, and if they avoid undertaking this sort of rigorous exercise of understanding, then technology is gonna move forward and it may not be for the best. We understand that there are so many risks um, in, that are inherent in technology. And one thing the agencies did just do is put out a, a joint statement, actually a request for information on artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it's, it's another good step forward. Um, it's a recognition the market is moving forward, but that's where we are. It's a step forward, it's a step back. And I think a lot remains to be seen about the regulators that are gonna be put into place by this administration. There's gonna be pressures to pull back in some areas and to move forward as well with, with uh, inclusive finance. So we're, we're at a crossroads here. Thank you, Amy. That's, that's really helpful to help set the stage and to particularly to provide a sense for what's going on in the banking side. You know, what I always find interesting is taking a look at, you know, what's happening in the bank regulatory world and then comparing that to how is that, you know, how, how, what are the parallels? What are the differences that are taking place on the security side? And so Troy, I might, uh, might shift it over to you here and just, you know, speaking about the, you know, from the securities and crypto context, I mean, there's obviously been no shortage of, <laughs> of innovation and change and disruption going on on that side of the house. Um, you know, how do you, you know, how, how would you characterize the SEC's approach um, to the kind of innovations that are taking place uh, that touch on their jurisdiction and, and how would you compare or contrast that to the banking side? Yeah, it's a great question and, and uh, great for the chance to share some thoughts here and to, to see everybody. Look, I think the question to broaden it out even a bit beyond um, the banking side and the capital markets SEC side, and think even more generally, which is, you know, what are the ways in which regulators approach any time when there's a lot of change, particularly technological change? And there's a fundamental question that the regulators and policymakers more generally have to confront, which is, do we think that that technological change in and of itself argues for some sort of change, significant change, wholesale change, more perhaps um, refinements when it comes to the regulatory requirements, or do they feel as though the regulatory requirements and the overall regime itself is, is up to snuff? When it comes to, say, digital assets, crypto, blockchain, the, the SEC, for the most part, uh, maybe entirely, but I'll hedge a little bit there, at least for the most part, I said, look, we think our regulatory regime is up to snuff. We don't think that it's necessary to come up with a whole new regulatory regime to um, address, to deal with um, the regulatory, excuse me, the technological change uh, that has come about. Frankly, whether that's on the crypto blockchain side or that as Amy was saying, on the artificial intelligence machine learning side, and you know, I guess we'll see what comes next, but I would imagine the regulators at the SEC will have a similar approach when it comes to what comes next. Now, why, why is that? Now, some people think that there should be more wholesale fundamental change, but why do I think that the SEC, at least at this point, hasn't gone in that direction? I think mean, part of the reason is, is if you think about you know, the key aspects of the relevant regulatory regime at the SEC, you think about the broker dealer side of things, custody, for example, gets a lot of attention. You think about the investment advisor side of things. You think about the what is it question, which is, is it a security in the first instance? When you, when you focus on those regulatory regimes, for better or for worse, depending upon one's vantage point, they do have a lot of flexibility built into them. And so then it's a matter of how do you apply those basic principles, those prongs, if you're thinking about the four prongs of the so-called Howey test for what's the security, if you're thinking about those various factors and considerations that drive the regulatory analysis. I think the SEC feels again at this point that they can um, account for changes in technology and that again, you don't need a significant change. Now, we've seen that perhaps in terms of getting the most attention when it comes to the question of what's the security and the application of the Howey test, a case that uh, we won't necessarily unpack the whole thing, but right, a case that was about orange groves in the 40s is now being applied 
uh, to blockchain. But, but if you just pause on that for a moment, the Howey test has always been articulated by the courts and otherwise as the facts and circumstances test. So if you take what I was just saying, I think the SEC's view is as well, the facts and circumstances are different. So the outcome is what the outcome is going to be, but the test continues to apply. Now, the practical challenge, again, different views as to whether the commission should take a different approach, but I think that captures it as it at its essence. The other side of that coin, if you're looking at it from the perspective of a business, whether it's an early stage company or a company that may be farther along in its growth and development, uh, the flip side of a facts and circumstances based approach, the flip side of an approach which is, which is somewhat perhaps principles based or factors based or considerations based is, well, exactly how are those factors and those considerations and those principles and those prongs going to apply to my facts and circumstances? Mm -hmm. Great that it's a facts and circumstances test, all right, there's some flexibility in there, but what about my facts and circumstances? To put that in, in different terms, the thing that you continue to hear is concerns about, on the part of many, regulatory uncertainty. And I think when you hear regulatory uncertainty, that can mean a lot of things. But one way to think about it is, is folks who are trying to get it right, trying to do the right thing, but aren't quite sure what it means to get it right and what it means to, to do the right thing. And then they ask us for, can we have some more guidance? Now, usually they ask for guidance is we'd like guidance in a particular way because we have views as to what we'd like the outcome to be. But even when you peel that away, oftentimes folks will just say, just, just let us know, right? Just let us know. And then we can plan our affairs accordingly. We can plan our legal affairs, our strategy, our risk management, our compliance. But when we don't know or don't know with enough certainty, then we're kind of going around in circles sometimes and that can make it very difficult to, to move forward. So that, from my vantage point, has captured the last few years. Mm -hmm. What are we gonna see going forward, just to take uh, 30 more seconds on that? I think coming back to something Amy said in terms of a lot of the you know, new folks aren't in their roles yet, um, hard to say. You, know, you yeah. never know, and you never know what, again, <laughs> the facts and circumstances, what events will present themselves. But one thing I, I will note um, quickly is this. The, the facts and circumstances big picture have changed, I think, in the following sense. If you think about you know, blockchain, digital assets, crypto, there are many, many more use cases now that demonstrate the power of the innovation than even just a few years ago. And I think as more and more call it real world use cases present themselves, in terms of how that technology and the associated innovation will make people's lives better. I think that can add to the case for making sure that the regulatory regime strikes the right balances and doesn't that in and of itself stifle innovation that holds all, all of this promise. So for that reason, if nothing else, I have a measure of, of optimism, but again, the details matter, the particulars matter, facts and circumstances matter. Uh, and I think there's still, you know, some question marks in terms of how this is all going to continue to unfold. Thanks, Troy. No, that's, uh, that's really helpful. And, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned regulatory uncertainty and, um, you know, Eric, I was wondering if we could turn to you. I know that you do a lot of work in the decentralized finance or DeFi space where it's hard to imagine a place where there's more regulatory uncertainty, <laughs> frankly, maybe there is one. I'm not sure what it is. Um, but I was like, you know, I was wondering if you could kind of building off of what, you know, build off of what Troy was talking about. I mean, given that you're advising uh, folks that are building projects or, or, you know, or companies in the DeFi space, like how do you how do you advise them to think about these issues of regulatory uncertainty and, and, and navigating that? Great. And, and thank, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Howard and Nick, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. And it, it's not a. a you know, it's a fact and circumstances type question, as, as, as Corey <laughs> suggested. Uh, the, the, the challenge is, of course, when we, when we think about DeFi, decentralized finance, right, is we have a whole, whole financial system that is built on regulating intermediaries, right? It's not everyone that can be a bank or everyone that can provide insurance or everyone that can, you know, advise on or solicit securities transactions, right? And so, you have this notion of regulating the intermediaries as the primary gatekeepers, and then that's how government enforces its policy objectives, right? 
the, the challenge with DeFi is um, you, you start to pick that apart, right? So if everyone can participate in providing insurance or lending uh, or, or pooling liquidity, and do it through a decentralized software platform where, where, where at some stage there's no one really kind of that's managing it. Mm -hmm. That presents a unique question, right? And then the thing that is challenging also is that when we seek to think about DeFi, it's, it's often, it's a continuum, right? So you have on one end, you have things that are very clearly centralized in control and things that are completely off in the wild. Often the answer is somewhere in between, right? There's, there's, there's someone that's keeping the lights off the often, there's someone that's maybe has the the god key or equivalent of, of some, someone's performing some function and that can change over time so when we're you know thinking about things and advising early stage DeFi projects a lot of it is you know there's not a black and white answer to this right but what we try to do to some extent so let's think about what the 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 government cares about you know there, there's the, there's the technical answer right and the technical answer is all, almost always there's a risk Right, and how much risk do you want to take? Uh, but then it's it's kind of challenging, you're channeling to some extent. What do the policymakers care about? Right. So there's a legitimate interest in things like preventing money laundering or terrorist financing, for example. Right. Um, varying levels of consumer protection. And so when we're talking about the early stage, even if they're making a software protocol, um, you know, can you build this in a way that it could work in a very centralized and compliant way? Right. Or is this the, you know, so, so for example, if you build it so it could function with a uh, anti-money laundering KYC node of some 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 sort, right? Or some a, a centralized financial institution could plug into this software protocol in a way and could still operate in a compliant manner, even if at some point you really no longer control all this, right? And so mm -hmm. often the, the advice is, is nuanced on the stage of the project, but it's like a lot of things you can, um, you know, you, you, you can legally um, sell guns, right? And they can be used for legitimate purposes and illegitimate purposes, but it's about building something that is kind of well-intentioned and can function in different environments. That's really, that's really helpful. Well, I have a lot of questions to ask you on that, but I, you know, just to we want to keep, keep the conversation moving here. And, and I, uh, you know, want to turn to you, Andrea, because you know, behind many of the regulatory, you know, when, you, when, when Eric talks about like, what do policymakers care about, you know, what, when Troy talks about, you know, principles based the room, if you will, is consumer protection or, you know, you're protecting vulnerable stakeholders um, in, the, in, the, in the system and in the market. Um, and so, you know, as this new administration settles in, you know, acknowledging that we don't yet know exactly who's going to be in which seat, I mean, how do you see and do you see the consumer protection priorities changing at the federal and state levels? And, and how do you see them changing? And then I think just specifically given our audience today, you know, how would you, like, what advice would you give to fintech companies in the audience about how, do, how these changing priorities might affect their companies? Right. Um, well, I think we have a pretty good indication that the two priorities, and we are hearing a little bit less from the Prudential Bank regulators, but that may not be quite so relevant for this audience anyway, so we'll focus maybe on the, the CFPB as the canary in the coal mine. Um, we still don't have um, a, a director yet, um, still waiting for, for Senate approval. So in the meantime, acting director Weijio has been very vocal and very active and done a lot of things almost daily. Um, their priorities right now are protecting consumers impacted and experiencing hardship from COVID, not surprisingly, um, and addressing uh, the administration's priority for um, uh, addressing racial inequity. Um, and, and those are not actually distinct issues. Uh, they're, both, they're both a lot of ways that uh, uh, financial service companies are expected to protect consumers from both of those things, but they actually intersect at times. And, and that's where really the, the hot button risk is. But, you know, digging deeper into that, I mean, not, none of that is news to anybody, I'm sure listening, but, you know, when you're thinking about financial services in terms of lending, I would focus, you know, I think focus will be on mortgage, auto and student, because that's where uh, the, those are our most important purchases in the eyes of the agencies. And that's where people tend to be most vulnerable. 
Um, when you're thinking about lending products, it's not just the origination side, of course, very much in the COVID context, it's the servicing and especially default servicing. So to the extent any companies are focused on, you know, looking at people who are in need of default servicing, whether forbearances or deferrals, if you are engaged in any kind of, um, you know, secured lending, making sure you're very careful about repossessions or for, you know, forbearance, or excuse me, foreclosures, um, late fees, NSF fees. I mean, any of those things where when people are down, there are expectations that the accommodations are going to be above and beyond and not just what the law requires. So a lot of attention to that. Also credit reporting, which anybody, you know, involved in, in a finance product where they're reporting to the bureaus, a lot of attention to that. Um, and then, of course, collections, you know, a lot of loans are going to go into serious default. Um, we've already seen one CID go out on legal collections uh, during people uh, during the pandemic or other kind of abusive debt collections. So uh, it would have been faster to tell you the things they won't focus on. But that's that's <laughs> kind of the list of things that um, just those few things. Right. Make sure, you know, you got it's all easy. Your getting on sticks. Um, so, but in the, so to move on to, to your question about kind of what does that mean for financial technology companies? It, you know, it's easy, I think, for companies that are very small or in a, a kind of a nascent stage to think, well, they're not going to look at me, my little company, right? Um, and they're probably right. <laughs> I don't want to acknowledge mm -hmm. that. They're probably right for a point. But just because the government doesn't come knocking doesn't mean there won't be a heightened scrutiny. Anybody working with bank partners, I mean, I will tell you, I hear this all the time. It, it's not just folklore. The CFPB in particular deputizes banks that have, you know, are in the bank partnership model to go look at their commercial clients, to look at the fintechs they're partnering with. Um, if you are partnering with a bank, they are now, they're expected to be their brother's keeper, right? So they're going to probably clamp down on any way because the pressure is down on them. So expect to see probably a different tone and level of scrutiny from your bank partners to the extent you have them. Uh, I think we shouldn't forget that it's not just happening at the federal level. States are going to become much more active that I've already seen New York DFS do some astounding things lately, <laughs> just in the last couple of months that I wouldn't have seen probably um, a little while ago. Um, and we have a new California CFPB-ish agency that is very eager to get up and running. Um, not to mention state AGs um, and the like. And, and of course, consumer groups feel very empowered right now. Their bank part, or excuse me, their government partners, such as HUD and F FTC and so forth, um, are, are back and running the way they want them to. So they work hand in glove. Um, and, and I think that, you know, there are ways that the CFPB can be very efficient in looking at small companies and what uh, they typically call it like a horizontal review where they'll send out, even if they don't examine you, they have enforcement power where they can send out a voluntary information request, which doesn't really feel very voluntary, as you can imagine. Um, and they can send dozens of those. If there's a practice or a product or a service that they're very curious about, the, the enforcement team will just send out these information requests do a dragnet, figure out who the weak gazelles are in the herd, and then pick them off for an investigation, which is a very efficient way for them to pick off um, certain companies that, that might be smaller. Um, and then I would just say also, you know, this is a, probably the right time for companies that if they um, don't have a compliance officer and don't have legal and they don't have kind of compliance counterparts, even if that's outsourced, this is probably the right time to start to think about a healthier partnership. <laughs> um, it's painful, especially if you've been kind of building in a way that was kind of putting that last in the queue um, or, or maybe deprioritizing it because you felt like the, the pressure wasn't there to do that. This is probably the time where with change, things changing almost daily, establishing a really healthy relationship between the business and, and compliance and viewing that truly as a partnership, as a as a way for them to keep you, um, you know, on track and compliant and profitable, but it's still, you know, not going down a path where it could lead you to, you know, something that would be, you know, either an investigation, or enforcement, action, or litigation, those kinds of things. So they, they are there to help you, you know, avoid that risk and yeah. learning sooner rather than later is probably the way to go right now. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrea. Just moving quickly on, Troy, I just wanted to touch quickly on what's been going on with GameStop volatility and certain stocks in the market. Like what changes do you see, if any, for, you know, some of the fintech companies in the audience or investors that are, might be working in the, you know, kind of the trading or investment space? 
Like, how do, do you see any kind of investor protection, sorry, investor protections kind of changing uh, as a result of what's been going on in the markets recently? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be real quick. Um, once again, I think from the, from the commission's perspective, um, you know, an anti-fraud is a pretty flexible concept and anti-manipulation is a pretty flexible uh, concept. And there's lots of anti-fraud and anti-manipulation provisions under the federal securities laws. Um, so that's point number, that's point number one. Now, I'm not saying anything in terms of what happened. It's just in, from their vantage right. point, I think they would say they would, they have the tools they need if they think something inappropriate um, uh, has happened. But again, facts and circumstances is always a case matter as, as is law, rules, regulations and the like. I, I think what was going to be particularly important to keep an eye on is to what extent does the SEC um, not just take up, but decide to make changes when it comes to questions relating to the mar to market structure mm -hmm. itself, um, the equity market structure. Um, and there's a lot there that one could get into, but but that I, and that's more on the policy making front. And then what does that translate into into rules, regulations, what have you? And just as a as kind of an underpinning to that. I think mean, they're going to sit back and say, all right, well, what, what are the ways in which our markets behave? What are the things that drive our markets these days? What are the things that really contribute to liquidity? How do we think about liquidity? How do we think about price formation? And do we think about it differently now than we might have in the past? And what might that mean then in terms of some of the underlying regulatory requirements if uh, some of the, the, the uh, foundations upon which they were built about how our markets operated perhaps have changed in, in, in uh, more recent years or even decades. So I think that's something to very much keep an eye on. Thanks, Troy. Eric, I was wondering if we could come, come to you real quick and just, again, just uh, on the, uh, you know, given that you work in so many kind of cutting edge uh, areas, you know, and, and many of which, you know, regulation has not yet formally caught up with necessarily, maybe, you know, like as to Troy's point, it could be uh, uh, existing laws and regs can be adapted to those circumstances. But I was just wondering, like, you know, if you could, you know, talk to, um, you know, just the, like the opportunities available to industry for self-policing, self-regulation, you know, establishing norms and the like. And, you know, is that something that, that different, you know, subsectors should be thinking about in your view? What, what are the opportunities there? Yeah, I mean, I think that definitely, certainly a situation where you have complicated, you know, complex technology financial models and the people that are closest to how it actually works and functions, right? Which sometimes in kind of the regulatory agencies, people, people aren't on the front line of what's actually happening you know, commercially. So I think there are, there are interesting and unique opportunities um, to, to both kind of self-regulate, right? And doing that maybe through industry associations and in certain contexts, um, and, and also by doing that, help to shape what ultimate formal regulation may, may look like by setting those examples, saying this is what you should be focused on. We know you're concerned about this. This is what we're doing. Um, one, one example of that, which we're involved in, and Troy mentioned some of the, the uncertainties on the facts and circumstances test for Howie, you know, very fundamental thing from a regulatory perspective is what is it? From a regulatory perspective, right? Is it a security? Is it currency? Is it, you know, something else, uh, commodity, et cetera? And so, one of the one of the organizations that we're involved with called Crypto Ratings Council, which what what they have done is take you know case law, existing guidance, their understanding of of the technology, and try to put a framework around it, right? And get all the facts and circumstances, and look at it more methodically, and just saying, hey. This is something that has a lot more attributes of looking like a, an investment contract, which is a security, or this is something that doesn't have a lot of those, those attributes. Now, it's not endorsed by any regulatory authority. It, it's, it's, you know, there, there's obviously risk whenever you're dealing with a digital asset, but it's an example of industry that's closest to technology, thinking about what do we know about this technology? What do we know about what the government has said is important and whether it's in case law, speeches, regulatory actions, et cetera, and let, let's, let's help to translate and build that bridge and take actions. Let's keep a, like an open dialogue with the government. So if they don't like what we're doing, they have the opportunity to provide influence and, and tell us what, what's going wrong. And I think there are a lot of opportunities like, you know, there are other areas like uh, the travel rule and kind of, you know, AML. There are other groups that are forming in different areas. And I think that there are certainly um, good opportunities there. You know, a lot of this is informal at this point. It's not like an SRO like FINRA right. is, right? 
And it may be that some of this evolves in that direction, you know, ultimately, but I think there's kind of a grassroots opportunity here to say, and preempt some bad regulation by saying, we're, we as an industry are being responsible in this sector, and we're translating that in a way that is, is kind of meaningful uh, in light of how the business is actually operating. Thanks, Eric. I know we're running out of time here. Um, I see Howard's popped back up on the screen. So I think that, that's a signal here a little bit. I wanted to, Amy, come back to something that you touched on a little bit. Um, I know that it's a, a passion of yours on the financial inclusion side. And I know that others in this group as well are, are, you know, feel very strongly about that. You know, I just wanted to, if you could just speak a little, you know, quickly to, you know, how you see, uh, you know, whether you see any kind of regulatory changes around you know, on the horizon for financial inclusion specifically, and then just maybe just touch a little bit on, you know, I think, I think a lot of folks thought of fintech as having this big financial inclusion promise. You know, I personally still think that that's true, but how do you think companies in this, in, in this space should, should be, you know, telling their story um, so that folks can kind of understand that uh, in light of maybe some increasing skepticism that we're seeing from some of the policymaker side? So I'll take the last question first. And I think what we are seeing is that yes, FinTech, this is, the, this is the promise that you made now show us. So I think companies that are in this space actually should be figuring out some way to objectively show, document. I know that there are one organization I'm involved with, Alliance for Innovative Regulation, is actually looking to put together these examples to show policymakers that good things are happening because we know that regulators are trained to focus on risks. So they need to also focus on opportunities. And I do think this is a critical time to show that their FinTech is for good in addition to risks and the risks need to be managed. So that's one thing I think uh, in the banking space, there will be a lot of attention on the Community Reinvestment Act, which is due to be updated. Uh, it's very sort of geographically focused in terms of its assessment of providing credit uh, in areas around branches. And we see, you know, a lot of branches have closed. Things are not so geographically based anymore. We certainly have plenty of mobile services, et cetera. The OCC went it alone, got criticized by just about everybody including for the fact that it went alone. Um, and so the Fed has already signaled it wants a different approach. And I think there'll be a convergence around something that will absolutely focus on low income, moderate income communities, um, you know, communities of, of color, so. That's um, great, thank you. Thank you. Howard, do we have time for one more? Yeah. Um... And I have a question I'd like throw in too, but go ahead if you have a question. You want. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly just, and we talked about it, and, and this is like a huge topic too, so we can be quick, but Andrea, on the on the machine learning and AI side, you know, we talked, we talked about how changes might be on the horizon there. Regulators are trying to wrap their heads around the technology, et cetera. I know you do a ton of work in the fair lending space. I was just wondering if you could give us like a quick 30, 30 seconds, 60 seconds on just machine learning and fairness and like how do you how do we think about algorithms and public policy goals well i think the way to think about it in terms of a conversation with a government agency is to my, my the judge i clerked for used to say write it out in crayon um and that's not intended to be a disparagement but you know when you're in it all day every day it makes sense and you have a certain vocabulary and i'm i think that the government agencies are going to get there but they're not there so there are going to be a lot of misunderstandings and so help them get there right be prepared to have this conversation as you said tell your story um but in the meantime you know that's part of it is being able to explain it how it works but also you know, it's it's gonna. There's always gonna be bias in models, right? It just it it happens, and and it's not gonna be because you use the wrong variables. But you do have to understand what's going in to understand what's coming out. So have a very good model governance process, one that is designed to be compliant on the front end, so that if you don't have to do all this testing to show that it, you know, there's nothing that's illegal about the product itself. So a lot of that front end work with your compliance and legal counterparts will be productive. Thank you. Howard, I know you maybe wanted to close it out. Yeah, I have one last question before we close. This has been a terrific panel, by the way. So, um, you know, we live in a world where the U.S. is no longer the only big dog in the world economy, right? And um, 
the the U.S. for a long time, you know, had the luxury of saying, well, whatever we do goes, and everybody has to play the games by our rules. Um, now uh, we have a world where uh, the rest of the world is a lot bigger than it used to be. Um, and where if you notice, you know, there, there, there are a lot of regulatory regimes, as Brian Brooks said earlier, which are actually much more forward thinking and forward fa fast moving and more um, um, accommodating to innovation than say the US traditional regulatory regime. Um, and so we have a, a competitive environment globally, which I, I would assume the US uh, needs to respond to if it's trying to think, um, you know, uh, in an innovative way. But nevertheless, we see, for example, several of these startups today, uh, which are outside the US saying, well, we're not gonna come into the US market yet because we're concerned about US regulation. We don't understand it. We think it's gonna be too restrictive or whatever. Uh, you know, there was a company this morning that's Latin America. There's another company that's European. Uh, there's an, another company that's in, in India, right? They're, they're all very interesting companies growing very fast, very big. And then also you heard about China um, you know, launching its uh, CBDC. Um, and, and then at the same time, the US is under pressure domestically, right? I mean, you have uh, the regulated banking industry being a smaller and smaller percentage of the total uh, transaction volume for whatever, right? As Brian pointed out. So there's pressure both externally and internally. So I guess my big question is, you know, how up to this challenge is the U.S. regulatory environment? Are, are, do do the people on this panel who are you know obviously very um, experienced with the U.S. regulatory regime or have or actually have having worked in it, how optimistic or not are they in uh, in the U.S. Um, government's ability to adapt quickly to this challenge? I think you left the easiest question for last, so that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the who's the who's the first uh, victim? I guess on that one. No, um, anyone? Andrea. I, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll say something really quickly, which is I think that that there is no intention to loosen the reins in terms of regulation. I think uh, uh, the government representatives that I've spoken to about this, they take great pride in the fact that we have such a st stringent um, set of standards, and and I, I am also aware of them collaborating with people in other countries, in Australia, in the UK, and others in Canada. Um, to find out what they're doing to protect their consumers and bringing it over here, right? So there, it's almost as if we have our own rubric and then we're taking the best of the best elsewhere and piling it onto our own. So I think that they have no shame in, in having this reputation of being really kind of, uh, you know, a real rubric of, of regulations. I don't see it pulling back. So I'll take a shot at it. You know, I just did a study about the UK Financial Conduct Authority and their quite innovative approaches to regulation, regulating fintech and reg tech and using their own sort of bringing reg tech in to do their own supervision and regulation. And it's quite something, but they have some attributes that the US system doesn't, including just twin peak regulators. They've got one prudential regulator, one conduct regulator. They seem to have parliament on their side most of the time, or it's not a thorn in their side. Um, there's just a national strategy to really support fintech in a way that we haven't seen here. And so, you know, we have such a stratified financial regulatory system that does get in the way. Um, it prevents some of the clarity in terms of what is it? What is crypto? Well, it, it depends and it depends on what agency is looking at it. So I, you know, and the other thing to go to Andrea's point, I do think that there are certain attributes that the US regulators see that they're concerned about, like with China and CBDC, they're talking about using it for monitoring. I mean, it's going to be, and, you know, here it's like we're, we're concerned about privacy. We don't want the government doing that. So I think there's a lot of impediments. So while there's some optimism, and a recognition we need to change. I think there's a, there are many things that are holding us back at the same time. Thank you, Amy. Great, any other comments before uh, we call it a morning or afternoon or evening as the case may be? <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I just I just want to thank everyone on the panel for for making it and you know really appreciate your time and enjoyed the conversation.